Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, sorry about the late start. We're just waiting for one more panelist, but we, we have her lined up to go last, so I think we can, we can make a start and get things going. Um, very warm welcome to you all, uh, especially those of you who are visiting York from uh, uh, the great outside. Um, and thank you for coming to join us on this uh, cool and cloudy afternoon. Um, my name is Philip Kelly. I'm the director of the York Center for Asian Research, which is uh, just upstairs from here. Uh, and one of the things we do at the center is to organize events that try to engage with uh, contemporary issues that are affecting uh, Asian Canadian communities uh, in the GTA um, and the nature of uh, Canada's links with, uh, with, with places in Asia. And so this very much fits into the kind of uh, mandate that we try to fulfill. Um, just a few administrative notes. There, there were some refreshments. They are for you. Please, uh, please help yourselves at any time. Uh, there were some washrooms along the corridor. There's one washroom on this corridor. The others are down the door to the left. Um, so please help yourself. Uh, to, uh, please go to the washroom if you need to go, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and help yourself to the toilet paper, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Um, and one other point, the, um, the proceedings are being filmed. We're filming it so that we can put the panel on, the, uh, on, the, on YouTube, on the web afterwards for those who aren't able to come during working hours. Um, also, uh, Veronica Silva is here from uh, ABS, CBN and TFC and she's filming segments um, in the hope that they will run a, a story on, 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 on the issues that we're addressing today. Uh, so to the, to the issues, uh, 10 days ago on November 30th, 2014, a new set of regulations took effect that changed the nature of Canada's live-in caregiver program. Uh, these changes have been announced um, in late October and essentially ended months of speculation around what the federal government intended to do uh, with the program. And it, it was known that something was, was in the works. Uh, comments from ministers were uh, speculating and uh, uh, talking about abuses of the program. Uh, widespread reforms had already been put in place for other aspects of uh, temporary foreign worker programs with promises that the living caregiver program was next. So it was clear that the change was afoot and uh, about a month ago it was, those changes were, were revealed. Um, and our task today is to, is to take stock of these, these changes, uh, to examine their impacts on caregivers currently in the program um, and on caregivers yet to come, and to ask what they imply about Canada's use of migrant labour uh, without permanent status and the nature of, of childcare provision, elderly care provision and uh, disabled care provision in Canada more generally. But we also need to place the current changes in, a, in a, a larger and longer historical context and a history of struggle around the program, especially within the, the Filipino community in Toronto and in Canada. And this starts with the foreign domestic movement uh, in the 1980s, uh, the introduction of the live-in caregiver program in the early 90s, um, and the tens of thousands of women that have arrived through that program, mostly from the Philippines, uh, and mostly um, to care for children, but also elderly and the disabled since then. And just to give you some sense of the magnitude of the program for those of you who are not familiar, over the 10 years from 2004 to 2013, um, over 45,000 live-in caregivers have arrived as principal applicants. Um, they've been joined by over 40,000 spouses and dependents. Um, but a, um, a number in the region of 60,000 uh, still remain in a backlog waiting for, for permanent residency. So the, the issues that we're discussing today touch the lives of, of very many tens of thousands of, uh, of people. So what I want to do is to introduce our panel to you who um, are both community activists and lawyers who deal very directly with the uh, with caregivers and the, the nature of the caregiver program. And I'll introduce them in the order in which they're going to appear. Um, the first is Pura Velasco um, at the uh, your right end of the table. Um, Pura Velasco was uh, as born in the Philippines and was a student activist at the University of the Philippines. She arrived in Canada in 1989 and was employed as a, as a live-in domestic worker. 
1991, she began working as a facilitator with Interseed, the Toronto Organization for Domestic Worker Rights. Hi, Pat. Um, pre uh, providing orientation workshops to recently arrived domestic workers. She served on the board um, of INSTRAC, the Institute for Training and Accreditation of Foreign Professional Graduates, and is a member of the Multicultural Committee at Mid-Toronto Mid Community Services. Her writing includes two widely cited essays. Uh, one is a book chapter in 1997 titled We Can Still Fight Back, in uh, Back and Stasiulis' Not One of the Family. Um, another was in Canadian Women's Studies in 2002, titled Filipino Wim Migrant Workers Amid Globalization. In 2010, Pura was awarded the Bromley L. Armstrong Award from the Toronto and York Region Labour Council for her advocacy work and leadership in the struggle to secure greater rights for migrant caregivers. And she is currently a spokeswoman for the Caregivers Action Centre in Toronto. Um, I will introduce all of our, our speakers in terms of, I'll move on to, to Faye Faraday, who is uh, second from this end. Um, Faye is a lawyer with an independent social justice practice in Toronto. She represents unions, community organizations and coalitions in constitutional litigation, human rights and labor. Uh, she's represented clients at all levels of court, including the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, for 25 years, she has been involved in litigation and policy analysis, addressing the rights of low-wage transnational migrant workers in Canada. I read that and I thought, 25 years? You must have been very young. Uh, <laughs> Faye holds an innovation fellowship with the Metcalf Foundation, when she, where she's engaged in research on the rights of migrant workers, and two of her recent publications have been made in Canada, How the Law Constructs Migrant Workers in Security, and Profiting from the Precarious, How Recruitment Practices Exploit Migrant Workers, and that was just recently, earlier this year. Um, both published by the Metcalf Foundation. Faye is currently the Packer Visiting Chair in Social Justice at York University and is also a visiting professor at Osgoode Hall Law School, of which I should have mentioned she is a, a graduate. Uh, thirdly, Dina Santos, on Faye's left, uh, is a dual citizen of Canada and the Philippines and was called to the bar in both countries. Her main areas of practice are Canadian citizenship, immigration and refugee law. She completed her PhD at Osgoode Hall Law School here at York with a dissertation entitled Human Rights and Migrant Domestic Work, a comparative analysis of the socio-legal status of Filipina migrant domestic workers in Canada and in Hong Kong. She has a master's degree from the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law in Sweden. Prior to that, she earned bachelor's degrees in law and economics, both at the University of the Philippines. She's also worked as human rights advisor at the Center for Human Rights and Equity here at York, and as the director for the National Capital Region uh, of the Commission on Human Rights in the Philippines. A.V. Go uh, is at this end of the, the table. A.V. is the clinic director of Metro Toronto Chinese and Southeast Asian Legal Clinic, and has served in that role since 1992. Uh, since her call to the bar in 1991, AV has worked exclusively in the legal clinic system, serving the needs of low-income immigrants with linguistic and other barriers in accessing the legal system. She was a bencher of the Law Society of Upper Canada and is currently part-time adjudicator of the Health Professions Appeal and Review Board and the Health Services Appeal and Review Board. Uh, AV has a bachelor's degree in economics and management from Waterloo, a law degree Toronto, from the University of Toronto, and a master's of law degree from Osgoode Hall Law School here at York. Yay. Um, in, uh, so we have three, 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 uh, three York law graduates on the panel. In 2002, AV received the Women's Law Association of Ontario President's Award, and in 2008 was awarded the City of Toronto's William P. Hubbard uh, Human Rights Award. And then Last but not least, uh, Pet is here now at the, at the end of the table there. Um, Petronila Cleto was raised in the Philippines but first came to Canada as an international student at Carleton University's journalism program in the 1960s. I did not know that until yesterday. It's amazing what Google will tell you. Uh, she returned to the Philippines and completed a BA in English and Comparative Literature at the University of the Philippines. There she became deeply involved in student politics and later became well known as a journalist, writing for some of the country's leading newspapers on politics, culture, human rights, and poverty. Pet immigrated to Canada in 1991 and since then has coordinated non-profit and community-based theatre workshops, managed a Manila-based uh, video uh, 
news agency, and produced documentaries on political prisoners and migrant workers. In 2008, she was the writer in residence at McMaster University, and in 2010 was lecturer in residence at the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences at George Brown College. Pet is currently Secretary General of the Filipina women's rights organization, Gabriella Ontario. So that is your panel. Um, there is a lot of expertise on offer this afternoon. Um, I've asked our speakers to talk for um, five to seven, we could probably stretch it to 10 minutes, uh, but we'll try and keep that limited so that there's time and opportunity for, for questions and, and discussion afterwards. Okay, so first is uh, Pua, would you like to step up? I think we're gonna speak from here if that's okay. okay. Yeah, Good afternoon, everyone. I will be uh, speaking on the experiential dimension of the caregiving work or domestic work. Canada's domestic worker or caregiver program is more than 100 years old. In the early days of domestic work history in Canada, women from England, the British Isles, and from the Nordic countries were automatically given permanent residency on arrival. But this, despite there being the proper racial stock, most of them were not spared from the exploitative working conditions and low status ascribed to domestic or caregiving work. Canada's solution to perennially high demand for domestic workers was the creation of the West Indian Caribbean schemes that brought women from Guadeloupe, Jamaica, and Barbados. The women came in with conditional landed status, and again, because of the uh, poor working condition in domestic field, the women moved to other jobs once they're done, they were done with their one-year domestic work commitment. In the 60s, Asians were considered an admissible class of immigrants by the Canadian and US governments. As a response to this inimical policy, the Philippine Congress threatened both the Canadian and the, and the US government with a reciprocal immigration bill. So as a result of that, our highly educated and skilled people were allowed to come into Canada as landed immigrants. Unfortunately, due to the Canadian government and society's discriminatory attitude towards domestic work, the domestic profession was excluded from the immigration point system. In the 60s and 70s, most of the participants to the Canada's domestic worker program, called the Temporary Employment Authorization Program, were Filipino and Caribbean women. They came to work for two years on temporary work, work permit. But the threat of being deported without the right to apply for permanent residency status provided a strong push for the Filipinos and their counterparts from other communities with their allies to launch the Good Enough to Work, Good Enough to Stay campaign in the 70s. So in 1981, the Temporary Employment Authorization Program was replaced by the Foreign Domestic Movement Program, or FDM. The FDM provided the chance for domestic workers to apply for permanent residency status upon completion of the 24 months live-in requirement for a specific employer. While the domestic workers and their allies welcomed the government's move to grant a pathway for domestic workers to acquire permanent residency status, the live-in for a specific employer requirement was fully established in the FDM program. I arrived in 1989, so I personally had experienced the FDM onerous added settlement and adaptation requirements for us to fulfill. At that time, we were required to get a release letter from our employer before we could move to another domestic or caregiving job. We had to attend two face-to-face -face interviews with an immigration officer to show that we were doing educational upgrading and volunteer work in the community. We had to demonstrate that we were self-sufficient by showing our savings despite our meager wages. 
And of course, during the interview, we had to demonstrate that we were able to communicate in English or French well. Since the live-in requirement for a specific employer requirement was fully entrenched under the FDM, in 1990, 1991, there were many domestic workers who were sent home due to the strict enforcement of the live-in requirement and the non-completion of the 24 months requirement on time. Some domestic workers were sent home due to subjective bias of the immigration officers who did the face-to-face -face yearly interview. And because of the precarious working condition plus the settlement and adaptation requirements that we have, we had to fulfill at that time, domestic workers' attendance to every interseed meetings in rallies were always high. Sometimes we would have a thousand domestic workers attending our meeting. And even though the provincial and federal governments kept on ignoring our concerns, we continued to do research advocacy and lobbying vigorously to demand for permanent resident status, employment rights, and social entitlements. So, in 1992, the federal government replaced the FDM with the Live-In Caregiver Program, or LCP. Under the LCP program, domestic workers are now called caregivers who are required to fulfill 24 months live-in work for a specific employer under the temporary work permit regime. Grade 12 education, one year caregiving formal training, or one year work experience and proficiency in English or French were the qualifying requirements to participate in the LCP. According to some academics, to soften the rough edges of the LCP program, the self-sufficiency settlement and adaptation requirements were removed along with the requirements for us to get release letters from our previous employers. The LCP program did not address the vulnerability of caregivers through the temporary status regime. The caregivers' fear of being deported prevents them from complaining about their precarious employment situation. The caregiver's goal is to complete the 24 months requirement so they can apply for permanent residency as quick as possible. This is the reason why we continue to demand permanent residency status for caregiver on arrival. We also continue to demand for better protection for caregiver under the Employment Standards Act, the WSIB, and the inclusion of domestic worker under the Occupational Health and Safety Standards Act. This is very important because recently, a caregiver named Martis Angana uh, uh, had an accident and sh she had a severe head injury and she died on uh, December 2. And we are calling for uh, an investigation. In 2010, the program was again reviewed due to the high incidence of employers' abuses and the unscrupulous practices of recruitment agencies. Immigration Canada this time had extended the three-year completion of 24 months requirement to four years. And in recognition of caregivers' unaccounted for overtime hours, Immigration Canada had accepted 3,900 hours of caregiving job of, or care, caregiving work in lieu of the 24 months requirement to complete the program. The health and workplace insurance coverage provided by the employer became mandatory. And the second medical e examination requirement for caregivers before they were allowed to apply for PR had been removed. I would call this gains the loosening of the noose around caregivers neck. But with the new caregiver program, I wonder if the small gains or concessions that we had are still there for caregivers to access. And what's generally troubling for us is that the new Canada Caregiver Program has ended the guaranteed pathway to permanent residency for a lot of third world caregivers. Five minutes or more. <laughs>
Thanks a lot. Um, you know, when, when we see changes like this come in, um, as they, and we've seen a lot of changes happen in the immigration system and in the temporary foreign worker program um, over the past year, uh, sometimes our attention can sort of uh, narrow down into dealing with the immediate crisis that we've been presented with. And so what I'd like to do is just um, for a minute uh, step back and remember what had been building politically over the last two years. Um, because one of the things that I think was a real success in terms of uh, the work that community organizers and caregivers and migrant workers and their supporters have done um, over the last number of years is build a really strong public discourse in Canada that looked critically at what was happening with the programs. Um, particularly over the last two to three years, that discussion built. Um, there was a, a broad range of, me of media attention uh, to it. When my first report, Made in Canada, came out in uh, 2012, one of the recommendations I had in it was that um, was that we should return to a system of um, permanent status on arrival, a permanent immigration system rather than a temporary system. And that was seen as, uh, uh, you know, dreaming in technicolor, right? Um, but by the spring of this year, every single major media outlet in Canada was calling for a return to um, robust permanent immigration. Um, within the context of uh, temporary labor, the live-in caregiver program was held up as, um, as a model because it did actually allow migrant workers to have a path to permanence. And um, so the workers from other streams of migration were pointing to the live-in caregiver program saying, if we're good enough to work, we're good enough to stay. You ca you've done it before, you can do it again, let's build permanent immigration. And as that cry went out, as every single major media outlet in the country supported that position, we saw a very sudden shift in the framing of the debate. We saw all of a sudden a very um, aggressive uh, insertion of stories about live-in caregivers, about how um, live-in caregivers were misusing the live-in caregiver program as a fraudulent family reunification process. Um, we were hearing stories about runaway nannies. We were hearing um, all these stories that started to, to um, undermine trust in the system and then lo and behold we get these changes that um, threaten the very quid pro quo on which that program was built. The exchange of labor for the promise of um, of permanent status. And I think that it's important for us not to get sucked into the immediacy of um, agreeing to that, to the framing to push back and say um, permanent residence and uh, the call for a robust permanent immigration system still is here and the changes that have been implemented undermine that very critically, not just for live-in caregivers but for all other migrant workers who had been looking at the live-in caregiver program. Um, so from that context, I want to take a, a, make some quick points about the changes that were announced because the information that's been given is remarkably slim um, with very little rationale uh, behind it. Um, Along with the, uh, the framing that we've been given, the, the federal government has, um, uh, in a very self-congratulatory tone, noted, um, quote, that Canada will set an all-time record in the number of um, permanent residents, uh, residencies granted to live-in caregivers um, this year and in the years ahead. They're saying that 17,500 this year with a further 42,500 to come in the coming years. And as uh, uh, Philip mentioned, there is in fact a backlog of 60,000 caregivers who have done their work, who are waiting for the permanent residency that is owed to them. And so those numbers that are being promised for processing of permanent residents are not a gift from the government. It is in fact their obligation to uphold their end of the bargain. So to present these changes um, in that framework as if there is a gift being given um, completely misconstru misconstrues what's happening um, on the ground. The, the framing of the changes also inaccurately characterizes the Living Caregiver Program as a temporary work program. Um, the, uh, uh, as the, the government's uh, news releases indicated, the, the quote from them, uh, quote, the caregiver program has been a feature of Canada's immigration system for many years as a component of the temporary foreign worker program. Um, it has in fact been a component 
of the permanent immigration stream and has been set out explicitly as a permanent immigration stream under the um, the IRPA and the uh, the accompanying regulations. And so uh, that framing erases the entire history and the struggles that led up to uh, the creation of the, the foreign domestic movement and the transition to the LCP, and it destabilizes the entitlement to permanent residents. And so that's another thing that we need to push back on in terms of how these issues are being talked about. Um, the removal of the live-in caregiver requirement, uh, live-in requirement is good. It is something that caregivers have been asking for for at least three decades. It brings um, the program in compliance with uh, ILO Convention 189 on the rights of, of uh, migrant domestic workers. But it's going to be important to see how that actually translates in, per in practice, to see whether um, that is something that uh, caregivers can in fact insist upon, or whether they will be simply presented with contracts that require live-in as a requirement as a fait accompli. Whether in fact, the way the government has presented it, they've said that if we remove the live-in requirement, it'll make these jobs accessible to Canadian workers. So does that mean that um, a, a, a caregiver from overseas will only get a work permit if it can be shown that a Canadian worker will not live out? or uh, do the work and live out. So will the work permit itself become the thing that ties and mandates a live-in requirement? We're going to have to watch that very closely to ensure that it is true consent, that the default is live out and that workers are um, only able, uh, required to live in if they truly consent to it and are paid um, appropriately. Um, so I think I, I am still... Uh, uh, hesitant in looking at it. While there are some pluses to that, I think we have to be um, cautious. Uh, the caps, obviously, on the numbers of, of workers coming in is the most controversial point. Um, what it does is it removes that, that commitment to a guarantee of access to permanent residence. The caps are set below the number of entries of, of living caregivers that have come in every year over the last 10 years. Um, and uh, so you're, the, while the caps are imposed on the permanent residency side, the demand side, the number of workers who are entitled to come in, is still entirely employer driven without a cap. So, not, um, so workers will uh, not know entering the program whether they are on a path to permanence or on the merry-go-round of temporariness. Um, so that is, uh, it makes their position much more, um, much more precarious. And I know that uh, Dina will talk about, talk more about that. Um, the splitting of the streams into the childcare stream and the uh, high medical needs stream, there's no rationale explained for that. It makes it more difficult for workers to accumulate their 24 months because they are locked into one stream or the other, um, as opposed to being able to move across them as they do currently. Um, but one of my biggest concerns when I look at this is that it's clear that the government intends to expand the scope of the caregiver program, right? They're moving it outside of the private homes and into um, the, uh, into the, the long-term care facilities more broadly. Um, the caregiver program, the high medical needs end of it, also is going to extend to encompass a broad range of female-dominated jobs, um, which currently allow um, women to immigrate straight up in their own names um, as uh, federal skilled workers. So um, in its announcements, the government has expressly stated that um, that caregivers in a variety of uh, healthcare occupations are going to be brought into this in the the, the um, high medical needs stream, including registered nurses, registered psychiatric nurses, licensed practical nurses, all of whom have a right to, right now to immigrate straight up without going through a two-step process, without having this lottery at the end of the day about whether or not they're ever entitled to permanence. Um, and so I think it calls for um, a much more critical look at what is actually going on with the system. It calls for much broader organizing um, with our allies in the community, in labor, um, across these, these, uh, these different streams because it is making it more vulnerable for all of us. And I'd certainly be happy to talk at greater length about what's happening with the express entry system because that is starting to look much more like what we have in the temporary foreign worker system uh, right now. I think that all workers are being made much more vulnerable um, and that, that what we're seeing here is is part of this trend to driving precarity for workers and giving more power to employers. 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So for my part, I would like to provide some context within which to situate our concerns with the, current, the recent changes to the caregiver program based on what we are seeing with current LCP permanent residence applicants. I am concerned that these may be occurring in line with, with these recent changes, especially the objective of eliminating the huge backlog as, as has been mentioned, there's an existing backlog of 60,000 permanent residence applications, which is th the fault of the government in the first place. So if, there, if, if this is true, if this suspicion is true, there's a high likelihood that more LCP permanent residence applicants will be experiencing similar issues in the near future. These trends that we have been seeing include refusals of permanent residence applications after wait times of four, five, six, even 10 years for some, based on alleged non-compliance of family members, for example, refusal of husbands to undergo medical examinations, provide police clearances, or even updated CIC forms. Another trend are refu is refu based on refusals um, due to the inadmissibility of family members despite requests from caregiver applicants to refuse the allegedly inadmissible family member from the application or an agency or a request on humanitarian and compassionate grounds to remove the inadmissible dependent. Another trend is, uh, involves refusals based on non-response to alleged emails or communications from CIC which, with instructions for fed further documents to provide. In a number of cases I've seen, the communications, alleged emails or letters were actually not received by the caregivers or their dependents. So it's becoming suspicious and it, it's, there is no reason for them not to comply if they indeed have received these this communications. So that is very disturbing. Fourth trend are refusals or removal of type B dependents. As you may be aware, type B dependents before the recent changes to the definition of the dependents have been implemented are those children who are age 22 or over but are continuously studying full-time since reaching the age of 22. So for existing li living caregiver applicants because they benefit from the transitional provisions to this changed definition of dependents, you can just imagine the great lengths that caregivers go through to ensure that their dependents, their type B dependents, are still included in the permanent residence applications. But despite these efforts, a lot of these type B dependents are either removed, still removed or refused because of the very, the most trivial of reasons. Uh, either the visa officer refused to believe the, the validity of the alleged um, full-time enrollment or they just refuse to believe that, that the, the children at their age, sometimes they reach up to 30 years old, are still studying full-time without any gaps. So because caregivers do not have the resources to go to federal court to judicially review these refusals, they have never been tested. So a lot of these cases have been happening lately. Also, there are refusals or inadmissibility finding of caregivers who are found to have performed unauthorized work because they perform live-in caregiving work for another employer who is not named in the work permit. And this is due to the very um, restrictive nature of the work permit wherein they are limited to performing work only for that specific employer named in the work permit. Okay, so in light of these trends that we are seeing recently, here are some of my thoughts on the recent changes to the caregiver program. First is the, the, the recent change of making the live-in condition optional, as, as Faye has mentioned, this is a good, this is a positive change, it's a good start, but it is definitely not enough. Due to the LMIA requirement of proving that there are no other Canadians or permanent residents who are available and willing to do the job, it is less likely, it is very unlikely that an LMIA will be approved for a live-out position. Hence, a caregiver would, would be left with very little choice then but to agree to a live-in position if only to increase their chances of being hired by a Canadian and for which a Canadian employer will be granted an LMIA. So although making the live-in op live option or live-in condition optional for the caregiver will reduce vulnerability to some extent, it will still lead to exploitation for many as long as the work permit remains tied to a specific employer. 
So it would, in my opinion, it would be better if the work permit is made to be occupation specific instead of employer specific because this will allow caregivers the flexibility in terms of working conditions. The more work, if they're able to work for other employers in the same occupation, the greater the income which will allow them to finance further studies, support their families, and the financing for their studies part which will be in line with the alleged current objective of enhancing career opportunities for caregivers. So on the next issue of the quota, the quota which is a very controversial aspect of these changes, aside from the fact that the quota is very low and which will surely exclude a lot of permanent residence applicants if it's, the numbers are not balanced with the entry or the existing um, backlog of work permit holders. There are so many questions which arise from this, um, this change. One question I have is, it is not clear what will happen to those applications which are caught by the quota. Will they be refused or returned or can they be resubmitted at, um, to, without need to pay new processing fee? Will the work permit app or the worker in the meantime be granted extended open work permits in the meantime? These questions remain unanswered. Minister Alexander in one forum um, that he attended trying to explain these changes said that the quota may be changed subject to demand. So if it's really true that they are sincere in meeting the demand, why impose a quota in the first place? So if caregiver temporary foreign workers are unable to obtain permanent residence and are caught by the maximum four year cumulative duration, which is again a recent change in the temporary foreign worker program, which um, encompasses all temporary foreign workers, including caregivers, that they are limited to working within um, working in Canada for four years, and if they exceed that maximum duration, they will have to leave Canada and wait another four years before they can reapply to come to Canada as temporary foreign workers. So if they are caught by this um, maximum duration, they will have to leave. But in reality, we know that they won't. A lot of them will stay, will lose status, and will suffer even greater vulnerability in the underground economy. My last point is that I believe that this changes signal an end to the flexible and constructive approach to facilitate the attainment of permanent resident status for caregivers that has been held in a number of federal court cases, such as Turingan versus Canada, a 1993 case, and Karim versus Canada, a 1998 or 1988 case, where the court has held clearly that the foreign domestic program or the live-in caregiver program after that was created in response to the recognition that domestic workers were performing a valuable service. The purpose of the program is hence to facilitate the attainment of permanent resident status for foreign domestic workers and the program should be administered in a flexible manner. Hence the court has, has clearly, and I've, I've loved citing this in all, in permanent residence applications of caregivers with certain issues involved, that the court, the federal court has consistently held that the purpose of the program is to facilitate the attainment of permanent resident status. It is therefore incumbent on the department to adopt a flexible and constructive approach in its dealings with the program's participants. With these recent changes, it appears that many of the gains achieved under this program are being clawed back. Some examples, some concrete examples are as follows. First, the variations to the advertising requirements to obtain an LMIA. The variation under the LCP is that if the Canadian employer wishes to employ a caregiver who is presently in Canada, the recruitment and advertisement requirement is waived. Under the current the recent changes to the caregiver program, there is no such waiver anymore. They will have to go through the regular advertising and recruitment requirements for all low-skilled and high-skilled workers in Canada. Second feature that, the second gain that is being clawed back is, as mentioned by Pura, the alternative option of proving two years of work. Quite, uh, just a few years ago, Minister Kenny announced that the two-year requirement can be proven by the alternative 3,900 hours of work um, within at least 22 months and can invoke 
390 hours of overtime work. Under the current caregiver programs, this does not um, exist anymore. A third gain that's being clawed back is the quick issuance of open work permits. Again, some year, a few years ago, Minister Kenny announced this so-called massive issuance of open work permits for living caregivers who have submitted their permanent residence applications but have not yet been granted approval in principle. So this is an exemption to the general rule that open work permits are only granted to inland permanent resident applicants who have been granted approval in principle. This was in recognition of the numerous cases of caregivers losing status because at that time it was taking, what, 14 months from the time that they submit their permanent residence applications to getting their open work permits, which was creating a lot of hardship, a lot of inadmissibility findings, because how can you survive in 14 months if you don't have status, if you're not working? So they are caught working without status. They're found inadmissible through no fault of their own, just because the government is so slow in processing their applications. So in response to that, the government quickly issued, announced this policy of quick issuance of open work permits. Under the current caregiver or the recent caregiver program changes, this does not, it's not clear whether this will exist or if there's even a need for this. Aside from the, the only clear statement that they've made is, or, or commitment that they've made is they'll expedite processing of PR applications, but there's no similar commitment to expedited processing of work permit applications, whether they're employer specific or open work permits for those who have submitted. So, it seems to be that this is again being removed. Another feature that is being clawed back is that the removal of the second medical examination requirement or the Juana Tejada law. This is a, again, a change in the living caregiver program that was implemented because of specific cases of caregivers who find themselves being diagnosed with cancer or some other serious illness and eventually refused, their permanent residence applications are refused because of medical inadmissibility, which is totally unfair because they come to Canada perfectly healthy, probably became too stressed with the work and incurred this illness, and are refused permanent residence for that reason. So the Juana Tejada law, by the way, which was achieved through sustained advocacy efforts. Without that, I doubt if the government would even in implement this exemption. So. We had that under the LCP with the current caregiver program changes. It, it doesn't apply anymore. I've just checked the checklist. There's a clear requirement for upfront medical examination for the principal applicant and their dependents. So that means this feature, which has benefited a lot of caregivers, is being removed. Next, the ministerial instructions. Uh, a line there, which raises a lot of concerns also, is that which states that requests made on the basis of humanitarian and compassionate grounds from outside of Canada that accompany any permanent residence application under the ministerial instructions will not be processed. So this is implying that because, as I said, uh, there have been a lot of cases where dependents are found to be inadmissible, so the only way to remedy that is request an exemption on humanitarian and compassionate grounds. But with this statement in the ministerial instructions, it looks like they're removing that option for the caregiver as well. And of course, the most obvious thing that is being clawed back is the right to apply for and obtain permanent residence after completing the required two years of full-time caregiving work. Under the present um, caregiver programs, because of the quotas, because of the added um, educational and language requirements, there is no such right anymore. It's, as Faye put it, it's, it's um, going to be a hit and miss. It's a, it's not a guaranteed option anymore. They're going to be part of a pool, and if they are found to not qualify under the permanent residence requirements, then, sorry, they will have to go. So those are my thoughts and apprehensions, mostly apprehensions about this recent uh, caregiver program changes. I'll be happy to discuss and answer questions um, afterwards. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. And I have to say, um, given such a depressing kind of looking afternoon, the fact that we have so many people here, 
uh, shows that this is an issue that uh, many of us are concerned about. And, uh, you know, we have heard from a number of uh, speakers who are very knowledgeable about the system. So, and I don't really want to repeat what they have said. Um, you know, they are already giving you a very uh, detailed analysis of the new changes. So rather than, you know, talking about that, I'm going to focus on uh, what we should do going forward from a strategic point of view. And I'm going to put that, first of all, in the context of the, I guess, you know, the political opportunities and reality, as well as the underlying kind of community dynamics uh, within, uh, sort of uh, behind this issue. So on the political side, we have a majority government in power, which according to some of the recent polls, still have the support of a sizable proportion of the Canadian public. On the other hand, however, we know that an election, a federal election is coming up uh, in 2015. Um, most likely will take place sooner rather than later in October. But within the community, we know that there are those within the Filipino-Canadian community and the broader community who actually support these changes. Uh, some because of, you know, their ideological um, sort of uh, their own ideal political ideology, while others, I think perhaps unwillingly, because they see the reform as a positive step uh, that will improve the lives of uh, living care, uh, caregivers. And uh, as, you know, as we know, there was a time when we didn't know whether the government is going to remove the pathway to permanent residence. So some people are happy to see that. Um, so for that reason alone, they are supporting the changes. And of course, I'm not saying that all the changes are bad. Um, but I think we need to be, um, um, I guess, before we embrace it uh, wholeheartedly, we need to be very careful about what is the uh, the concern and, you know, in light of the, some of the comments that are made today. So that takes me to my uh, presentation on the next step. So I kind of like divided into three areas. The first is education, second is monitoring, and third is advocacy. And I think we need to start by education. Um, educating not only just the living caregivers who are in the program or who are about to enter the program, who will be affected by the change, but also educating the broader public in general. Because I know there's a very, uh, a lot of misinformation and miscommunication, uh, misunderstanding about the changes that need to be clarified. So for instance, a lot of people may not uh, realize that the living Live-in option is like an optional thing, but it doesn't mean it's been removed. Um, so I think that just hearing that in the media, and we know that this government is very good in communicating their changes in a way that seem to appear that is a positive thing, right? So a lot of people wouldn't know about some of the changes that, you know, for instance, Deanna talked about. And as you know, sort of, uh, Faye has mentioned, like you know, in the past we have had very good, um, you know, sort of the the living caregivers themselves have mobilized their sub, uh, community support and been very successful in campaigning um, through the public, uh, you know, sort of uh, the media uh, to to push for certain changes to the program, right? So we need to keep that momentum going, and we need to. The only way to do it is to educate the public about the real impact of the changes on living caregivers. Otherwise, I think a lot of people will be misled into believing that this is, uh, they are all good, right? You know, all this is good thing, and they will not be as sensitive or be uh, as informed about the plight um, you know, of uh, living caregivers uh, in the future. And, you know, if they are less informed, they will be less sensitized uh, to, you know, to be uh, supportive of any changes that we want to uh, push for uh, in the future. So education of both the living caregivers themselves and the pub general public is very uh, important. So once we have done the education, or at the same time as we do that, we also need to do monitoring, right? As Dina uh, and both uh, Faye have talked about, um, there are a lot of uh, uncertainty about the reform. We don't know how many people will in fact be accepted uh, if they don't live in with their employers. We don't know how many living caregivers will be even be able to get the work permits or meet the heightened uh, education and language requirement in order to get a permanent resident status. Uh, we don't know how many will go underground if their application is rejected. Uh, how many will get some kind of, a, uh, you know, other ways of uh, staying in Canada, 
if they are you know kicked out of the program we don't know how how these all these changes are going to impact different caregivers from different countries differently like while the majority are from the Philippines there are caregivers uh, from other countries like China for instance like you know we do have a lot of uh, we do see some uh, some clients coming to our uh, clinic, for instance, uh, from China. Will they be affected differently because of the language requirement, for instance, right? So all of this is like um, uncertainty, and we don't know what's going to happen to the 60,000 applications, right? So the government said they're going to clean up and you know sort of clear the backlog, but does that mean just? rejecting everybody <laughs> or just throwing them out as they actually did with the independent gloss uh, you know program right so they clear the backlog by saying that we're not allowing anybody in right so is this how they're going to clear the backlog or is it through some other ways right so these are all the questions we don't know the answer for and we need the answers and so to that end i think we really have to think about how to keep track of these right so my suggestion is for instance we should start thinking about how do we work together like maybe institution here at york university uh, should partner with some of the community organizations who work with living caregivers we should start developing a plan um, to how to access, uh, you know, start compiling uh, data on the ground and maybe uh, make requests to information um, about these, uh, you know, the data that we need, right? So that we can keep track of the actual effect of the implementation of the new changes. And of course, depending on what we find out from this process, then we can move on to the, the third component, which is uh, efficacy. So, the government claims that these changes will help prevent abuse, right, uh, towards uh, living caregivers uh, while providing them with a pathway to a permanent resident. But it's up to us to make sure that these changes will, in fact, live up to these uh, stated goals. If not, then we will have to push for further changes or to push for the reversal of some of these changes. But that we can only do if we continue to have that public education and the monitoring kind of process, uh, an ongoing campaign that engage the public and uh, keep them informed about the issue, while at the same time gather the necessary intelligence about the real impact of the changes. And at the same time, I think we, it's very important that we have a, a, uh, a coherent and clearly articulated position on what we want at the end of the day for living caregivers and try to seek a broad uh, support, if not consensus, of our proposal, um, you know, of, of what are the changes that are needed to improve the lives of the caregivers. And as we know, as I mentioned, there's a you know, federal election coming up. So perhaps we need to start engaging the opposition parties now, um, present uh, our position. And I just heard, uh, you know, just before the panel started, the NDP is proposing a motion to remove the caps. So we have to discuss, you know, is it something that we should push for, work with the parties and work, you know, work with the liberals as well to try to get at least the caps removed, if nothing else, at this moment. And, and recognize that as long as there is an equality and the, between the global north, global south, there will still be living caregivers who are trying to come here no matter how harsh the conditions is and how you know, sort of tough the, the, these uh, restrictions are. They will always hold out the hope that at the end of the day, they will get permanent resident status and that's the reason why they're, they're coming. So it's up to us you know, to make sure that, that that will happen at the end of the day. So those are my comments. Good afternoon. I'm happy that uh, I heard all these uh, critical comments and uh, I'm happy because uh, now I'm assured that I'm not the only one who's going to be critical. Um, I'm going to focus on permanent residency and why it is the key concept to bettering the lives of uh, living caregivers or caregivers, plain caregivers now, I guess. When Minister Chris Alexander rationalized the recent changes to the LCP, he used the term vulnerability as if everyone, government officials and caregivers alike, had the same understanding of the ill condition that the announced changes would remove. However, 
the transformation of a living requirement into an option shows that the government either misunderstood or just wanted it to go around or wanted to go around this so-called vulnerability of the workers. This vulnerability of a caregiver as shown in uh, the optional uh, leave out seemed to be understood by government as merely a possibility for the worker to be abused. It was a possibility that may be realized only if the workers live in the same place as their employer. If one looks closely, however, what really happens is that the live-in part of the situation only serves to aggravate the vulnerability that is already there. The vulnerability remains an element in the very dynamics of the people involved in the live-in situation, live-in work situation. The people involved, first, the non-family member inside the family's home, a person of a different race, a stranger who is poor but whose labor, the head of the family purchases, and this stranger is working in a very private space of the employer's home. Then you have an employer who must control her labor and the behavior of this stranger inside the house. These are dynamics that cannot be changed by the worker merely going to sleep outside of the home. The dynamics is essentially that of a powerful employer who can control the worker's time and work and can do almost anything inside his own property because there is no third party to monitor or evaluate how he behaves toward his worker and of the migrant worker, on the other hand, who knows she must satisfy the needs of the employer for her caregiving and domestic work in order to acquire the money needed by her family. Who this worker is also very isolated from the rest of society. And unless that isolation is broken, she will have no idea about her rights in this foreign country. She who is so focused on the dream of getting her family to come to Canada and live with her, she fears every sign that she might lose her job. So the crucial and deciding factor in this dynamics is how the employer will use or abuse his power. The reaction of the work is almost negligible, and patience and forbearance only will prove her survival. Thus, even if a caregiver lived out, an employer, if he so wished, could still demand longer hours of work, demand multiple services, and in any way not follow the terms of the contract. So, the optionalization of living in is not a realistic solution that goes to the heart of the matter. On the North American continent, the concept of domestic work has always related to that of the master-slave relationship, an unequal power relationship brought over to the new land by settlers from Europe. As we all know, America's civil war was over the slavery of the Negroes, whose lack of status or rights as persons and workers was the basis of the economies in the American southern states. So in Canada as well, the urban populations partly developed because of the domestic labor force brought in from Britain and other European countries at first. It is time that we started looking more closely at the psychology of employers in Canada and explore that yet unknown part of the dynamics of domestic work where concepts of superiority and of control of a stranger who has a precarious immigration status living in the home make up an important factor in the workplace conditions of foreign caregivers. We would also recommend a central registry of employers as a starting point for this exploration, which may also suggest ways in which the working conditions of caregivers inside the home could be monitored. Although we habitually assume that our contemporary societies 
such as our Canadian society, are based on democratic principles. In order to find where we can progress and make important changes, we must look now into how the concept of slavery manages to exist in our times. This has been started, this kind of uh, discourse has been started in America with Angela Davis. Angela Davis says in her book about the black woman's plight in America, the context of present day migrant work in America must be seen as part of the historical context of slave labor. She points out her preliminary preliminary insights into the special situation of the female slave in the Old South, and I quote some, where work is concerned, strength and productivity under the threat of the whip outweighed considerations of sex. When the abolition of the international slave trade threatened the expansion of the cotton growing industry, the slave holding class began to rely on natural produ reproduction among their slaves as the surest way to replenish and increase the domestic slave population. Rape and all other special abuses inflicted on women facilitated the ruthless economic exploitation of women's labor. So we have another angle on domestic work, abuse as a tool of control of women's labor. Advocating for the rights of temporary workers in countries overseas is a continuing effort of the uh, women of the South and their supporters. Given the intense globalization of business and the conditions of work, the impact of women on women migrant workers have to be carried internationally by their representatives and their advocates. In 1993, the World Conference on Human Rights held in Vienna came out with a document entitled End Modern Day Slavery. Pointing out that migrant workers are our modern-day slaves, estimated that year to be 70 million. The document stated that in many countries which are considered to be third world countries, the governments have institutionalized the export of labor. So it is with the Philippines. We have the labor export policy, which is continuing to this day from 1972, when President Marcos dictated its uh, promulgation. Instead of solving the problem of growing in unemployment, these governments send the bulk of its people abroad and use the money they send back home to service the government's huge foreign debts. The document from this 1993 World Conference is not notable, not only notable for calling migrant work a slavery, but also notable for its clear recognition that women migrant workers, who that year made up 45% of contract laborers, are doubly or even three times burdened because they suffer the additional problems of sexual abuse, harassment, and rape. Linda McGovern of Indiana University gives us an update. She writes that by 1998, women comprised the majority of exported labor at 61%, and by 2000, that rose to 70%. She says that women, even, if they, even as they have precarious immigration status and do precarious jobs, they thus carry the brunt of foreign debt and suffer the triple oppression of gender, race, et slash ethnicity, slash nationality, and class as overseas migrants. So back to the 1993 World Conference, among its demands, top of the list, ensure migrant workers have the right to stay. Grant immediate independent residence permits to all migrant workers. Among the delegates in that conference was uh, Gabriela Philippines, uh, an alliance of feminist organizations from different sectors in the Philippines. Emmy de Jesus, now a congresswoman under the Gabriela Women's Party, stood up in that conference for Filipino caregivers in Canada. That was 10 years ago. What she voiced out was one of the top demands by foreign caregivers in Canada. 
For ever, ever since the permanent resident status was removed from, as uh, Pura had mentioned, from the Caribbean domestic workers, the conditions of many live-in caregivers have worsened and negative elements have easily festered in the unmonitored dynamics that I have spoken about. That lack of monitoring is another contributing factor to the impunity of abuse in live-in work. The next important demand of caregivers in Canada was also included in 1993, and this was the abolish the live-in arrangements for foreign domestic workers in countries where it is to the disadvantage of migrant workers. There's a qualifying phrase there, if it is to the disadvantage of migrant workers. This demand shows the realization that women workers have, have to suffer the negativities of the dynamics. And these negativities develop not simply because they live in with their employers, but because of the precariousness of their immigration status. They know that their visas are tied to one specific employer. So regardless of where they live, they fear that they may cause, and they always fear this, that they may cause any irritation in their employer, since that displeasure can result in threats of deportation. In 1996, this slavery-like conditions are also mentioned in the Consultative Forum on Trafficking in Women. And they also recommended giving permanent status to these women. Ten years later, in Canada, in 2006, the Toronto-based Coalition for the Protection of Caregivers' Rights, of which uh, Pura's group was a member, prefaced its recommendations by acknowledging the preceding 20 years of lobbying and advocacy work by alliances among domestic workers, community associations, faith-based groups, academics, as well as labor activists. Among its recommendation, based on its ongoing work and consultation with live-in caregivers, uh, on the top of the list of the recommendations were the same demands as in 1993, providing the caregivers permanent residency upon landing, eliminate the mandatory live-in requirement. There were important additions in the 2000 recommendations of the coalition, which gave basis to the demands. The first recommendation stated that the high demand for li Filipino live-in uh, live caregivers in Canada must be recognized, and therefore, the capabilities of these Filipino workers must be legally recognized in their immigration papers. The recommendation called for a precondition that the application of caregivers for permanent residence should be accorded full points for education and experience under the National Occupational Classification last listing. In effect, this would make them eligible to enter Canada as permanent residents upon landing. The second recommendation, the abolition of the live-in requirement, added this. When caregivers live with their employers, they are often vulnerable to economic abuse, which means long and flexible hours, non-payment of overtime hours, pay below minimum, minimum wage. Also, physical and sexual abuse and invasions of their privacy, as well as control over their mobility. There are two important changes that have repeatedly been asked through the years by the caregivers and their advocates. Ensure full economic, political, social, cultural, and legal rights of migrant workers. Number two, ratify and implement the 1990 International Convention of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Their Families and other applicable ILO conventions and recommendations. We have to add today the Convention for, my, for Domestic Workers. 
It is a large package of changes that foreign caregivers in Canada need, but because of all the concomitant dangers linked to the status of a temporary foreign worker, the key is the granting of permanent residency upon arrival. Perhaps a certain realization must first happen before government can even think of granting caregivers their rights. The, the realization that devaluing domestic and caregiving work by assigning it to women and by keeping that at the cheapest wages and putting this labor under the control through the perpetuation of abusive conditions. All this ultimately create a culture of women and families that cannot function as nurturers of the young. It develops a culture that cannot give care for others because its skills are oriented towards making use and exploiting others. And in the end, it is a culture that cannot care for itself because it has left to others the responsibility of understanding them and providing their needs. It is a culture that is at its core dehumanized. Let's hope that awakening can come soon enough. Okay, thank you everybody. Uh, a very, very rich set of uh, comments there. We've heard about the, uh, the specifics of the, the changes that have been uh, implemented in the last two weeks in terms of the, what they promise and, and uh, what, it, what is not likely to be delivered, and in terms of what they claw back from uh, the rights that have been won in relation to the um, now defunct caregiver program, live-in caregiver program. We've heard about the, um, the context of that in terms of the historical development of the program from, uh, from Pura. Um, from Faye in terms of its wider context and impact of the chamber changes on uh, temporary foreign workers more generally, uh, on um, other kinds of uh, professions, particularly gendered professions, and a widening and deepening of precariousness. Uh, we've um, heard how this has, uh, needs to be analyzed in the context of intersecting race, gender, class, uh, and migrancy um, axes of difference. Uh, we've heard about the ways in which this fits briefly, at least, into a wider question of how care is provided in in Canadian society and transnationally. And then finally, about strategies for, for education and, and mobilization moving forward and, and the demands that are, that are needed.